Tradition. Conservation. Family. The outdoors. It matters to you. It matters to us. This is Hunting Matters. Presented by Houston Safari Club Foundation. Here's Joe Bitar. Good Saturday morning. Welcome back to Hunting Matters on KPRC 950 AM. I'm your host, Joe Bitar. I am Ramon Robles. And uh, Ramon, how'd you, how'd you uh, fare through the big winter storm oh, of 2021? Man. It was very depressing in that we got to see snow all around the greater Houston metro area, right. except for the Houston metro area. Yeah, the, the, the line was just right out of reach. Yeah, and I wanted to take my kids somewhere up to to like stay there Saturday night and Sunday to see it, but it just didn't work out. And yeah, just kind of, you know, you don't get that opportunity often, especially yeah. down here. Yeah, I, you know, but we had snow early, so I'm encouraged by the fact that it was early and we could get it, you know, again in February. You yeah, know. they're talking about the polar vortex has sprung and, yeah. you know, it's coming down. So, hey, I'm all about that. I saw the, I saw the polar vortex warning. Yeah. Uh, this would be the year for it between this year and last year. This would. Yeah. Yeah. yeah r- why polar not? Polar vortex. Absolutely. And, who knows? Blizzards, Freeze hurricanes. Everything. Yeah. Who knows? Now, I'm a little excited to get out of here, not for any other reason than as soon as we're done here at 7 o'clock, I am on my way down to the valley to go hunt. Oh, yeah? My first hunt in about 18 months. Where are you going to hunt? Uh, I'm going to hunt deer, okay. or as you were calling that, doe. I don't know what the difference is. Um, <laughs> are doe the ones with the antlers? Yeah, oh, sure. If you want to, okay. you want to believe that. But I'm actually just uh, hunting for hogs because okay. I, I I got a deer a couple years ago. Yep. Half of it's still in the freezer because none of my family eats it. It's right. just me, and so I'm just going to eradicate the varmin that is a hog. Yeah, or six. Well, well, if, you know, if you do get a doe, though, you could uh, have it made into sausage and don't tell anybody because venison uh, yeah. sausage is phenomenal. And, and unless you're a sausage connoisseur. <laughs> You can't tell. Not my they wife mix in that fat, and it's yeah. delicious. That's the lesson I learned is yeah. she would have never known the difference. Yeah, venison sausage is uh, – I think it's, even people who don't have a real taste for wild game or for or for venison, it's it's an easy pass. Mm-hmm. And it's a great gift because people are always wanting sausage. Yes. So cook a little tenderloin or some ribs, throw in some venison sausage, nobody, nobody would be the wiser. I made the mistake of assuming that, again, my AR would be just fine, which it is. But I made the mistake of thinking, well, I can wait a week till I go hunt to find a rifle. Yeah. Have you tried to find anything at uh, a gun store here lately? You can't find anything. Yeah. Ammo, that, yeah. weapons, rifles. I, I just saw a price of uh, a box of 9 millimeter. It's, whoa. Yeah. yeah. So here we go. Yeah. So you're not prepared? Well, I'm prepared. Yeah. Uh, I have like four uh, bullets in my gun. Okay. And then, you know, slingshot or whatever. <laughs> a noose, a spear. <laughs> yeah, trap. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, I'm ready. But I just thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat myself. I'm going to give me a nice rifle. Yeah. A proper rifle, proper hunting rifle. Sure. And, and they laughed at me. I yeah. walked in and they're like, you know, come on. Seriously, what yeah. do you need? What do you think we are, a gun store? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it'll be the old well, that's, AR. To, to, you know, to some degree, that's the positive thing. I mean, we've talked about it before with the increase in... Firearm sales, hunting license sales, fishing license sales, and those sorts of things are just off the chart in the past year, mm-hmm. which is good because yeah. that tells you people are you know wanting to get involved in the outdoors. So that's one aspect of yeah, it. That's a my good my uh, uh, my cynical belief is that you know with the new changing of the guard yeah. in D.C., there might be a little panic buying, but you know that's just my perspective be. because of my day job Monday and, through Friday. And I've got a friend that works uh, that owns a gun shop up in Pennsylvania, and he said since March of last year. They have just not been able to keep things on the wow. shelf. Well, that's good because so. that means people are getting out there and, and hunting, and that, yeah. that is great. I mean, since the pandemic started, I mean, they just they can't keep anything on the shelf. Yeah. They've had their best year ever in the history of their gun gun shop. That is so, great news. Yeah, really good news. Um, so while we're talking about hunting and fishing, our guest today is Pat Murray. Pat is the national president of the Coastal Conservation Association, and we're going to get into what CCA does and what uh, Pat's history has been. But uh, I did want to tell folks that um, – there's an opportunity out there, lots of opportunities out there for a great way to introduce people to fishing. Every fall and winter, um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department stocks trout, rainbow trout. I was going to talk to you about that. Um, into, uh, they do about 300,000 trout into 200 community lake streams, river uh, tail races, state park ponds, and they're free to go catch. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's like 14 air, uh, locations in Harris County alone. Mm-hmm. So I encourage people to go to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department website at tpwd.texas.gov. You can type in 2020-2021 trout stocking schedule and find out where they're stocking, when they're stocking. And you don't need anything but a, a pole, really. I mean, yeah. you're not fly fishing for these things most part. I mean, along the Guadalupe River and those places, they, they fly fish for them. But 
in these areas, lakes and ponds, you can go out there with a can of whole kernel corn and a hook, basically. And is that true? Yeah, whole yeah, whole kernel corn. What? Yeah, go buy a bag of frozen corn, go buy a can of corn, and the trout bite on that. So wow, it's a great way. I to use inter- bologna. Sorry, bologna yeah. works. Uh, night crawlers, worms. Yeah, night crawlers. But it's a great way to introduce somebody to fishing or take kids fishing, and it's easy and. Um, you know, if you're younger, uh, 17 or younger, you fish for free at the neighborhood fishing program lakes. And if you're adults, of course, you have to have a, yeah. a fishing license. Uh, but if you're in a state park where they do the releases, then you fish for free. So Yeah, that's great. Tom Bass Park in Pearland yep. is where I just took my – I just got my boys into it. We have right. a, a cane pole, and we literally put uh, baloney on the hook. Yep. Hadn't had anything. But I just found out that literally last Saturday they stocked Tom Bass Park. Oh, wow. So we're going to go, uh, I guess, next week because Daddy's yeah. going hunting today. Yeah, rainbow trout are delicious. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's a good opportunity for people to Very get out cool. there and get outdoors and get some fishing under their belt. For so sure. Today uh, joining us is Pat Murray. Pat, again, is the national president of the Coastal Conservation Association, or more, more affectionately known by most people as the CCA. You can learn about them at joincca.org. Pat, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Hey, it's a real pleasure. I uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. I like it a lot. Well, we appreciate you got you being here today. Yeah. Um, so, Pat, uh, we're going to talk about all things CCA, but um, you're currently serving as the national president of the CCA. Uh, I'm just curious, and uh, Ramon was asking me earlier, what, what did you do before you came to CCA? You know, it's funny. Um, I was a, a light tackle fishing guide on the Upper Texas Coast. Oh, I, nice. um yeah, so I knew of CCA um, long before I worked here, and um, and even volunteered some, and donated trips, and and had gotten at least a eye, pretty good eye of what this organization was capable of by the very waters that I fished, and um, and so I walked into um, the job itself with a deep adoration for not only what the organization had accomplished, but that the model um, still had so much leg in it and could go so far, which indeed I've, I've been fortunate for almost 25 years now to watch. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get uh, do a deep dive. Uh, pardon the pun. Right? <laughs> we're going to do a deep dive. Ramon's a fishing addict, so this is right mm. up his alley. I'm going to ask some ignorant questions. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, Pat, just before we uh, go into our first break here, how, how encouraged are you to see the huge increase in hunting license sales this year? Oh, it's amazing. Hunting and fishing has, Hunting and fishing. has been embraced like never before. We were begging people to go, and now, they, uh, now they're now they just begging for a spot to hunt or fish. So it's, it's great. Yeah, I'm excited about it. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break here on Hunting Matters on KPRC 950. Join us on the other side. I've never been Lazy yellow moon coming up to tonight, shining through the trees. Crickets are singing in a light. Good morning. Welcome back to Honey Matters on KPRC 950. I'm thing number one, Joe Pitar. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ramon Robles. That, that threw me for a loop. That's funny. Very good. You know you're thing number two. Yeah, I am. I am thing number two. I've uh, been called number two plenty of times. <laughs> Thank you, folks, for joining us once again this week on Hunting Matters. Uh, we're talking today with us, uh, we're very fortunate to have Pat Murray. Pat's a national president of the Coastal Conservation Association, or CCA. You can learn about them at joincca.org. Good morning, Pat. Hey, good morning. Glad to be here. So before we went to the break, uh, Ramon was uh, wide-eyed and, and bushy-tailed thinking about uh, fishing. Uh, he's got uh, two kids, a three-year-old and a five-year-old, mm-hmm. um, that are, are – uh, at that perfect age to introduce to fishing, put a pole in their hand and lead them out to water. So, uh, what, what, what has been your, uh, uh, you know, I know you've had a lot of experiences with young adults and with youth. I mean, what, what is it about it that's so special and what can we do to get more kids into fishing early? God, there's a lot in that question. Um, I know. You know, there's a lot of magic that's found at the coast because, and sometimes it's the the fishing trip that the key takeaway has nothing to do with the actual fishing. It may be the experience of seeing the power of the ocean. It may be picking up a piece of trash and feeling like you actually made a difference, um, and which is sort of the advent to a, a conservation ethic. Um, honestly, it can be seeing a crab and going, "What in the world is that thing?" Um, all of those happened for me. Um, 
and and then of course getting a bite, be it a piggy perch or a speckled trout or whatever it is you catch, that is just incredible. The bonds it creates. I mean, the, my fondest memories. I tell people all the time. I don't, I don't remember my first bike ride, uh, my first day at school. Honestly, my first day at college. Um, but I remember the first flounder my dad caught because it looked like he'd caught a Martian. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> And that doesn't that doesn't just happen when you're sitting in a desk chair. That happens on the ocean. And um, so there's there's a lot of reasons to get kids involved early. And um, and I, Ramon, I applaud you um, for getting Thanks. your kids involved early. That's a wonderful gift you're giving them. I appreciate that. Yeah, it it is. Whether it's hunting or fishing or whatever your your passion is, I I still remember conning an, uh, uh, my uncle into taking me fishing. I had an aunt that lived on the bayou in Louisiana, and I would go stay with my aunt and uncle, another aunt and uncle. Um, from time to time, and I would go into his storage room, and he would have these old metal tackle boxes with these old baits and lures, and they just fascinated me. And I, I he he used to say uh, before he passed away, he'd say, "I remember Joe, when you were a little boy, you'd come and go, what you doing today, Uncle Thomas?" And he'd look and he'd go, "Well, I'm doing this, that, and the other." And this this guy looked like the guy in that picture of American Gothic that was holding oh, yeah. the picture. <laughs> That's what my uncle looked like, yeah. exactly. And as we got older, we called him UT to make him feel cool, Uncle Thomas. But I'd walk in, and I'd kind of lean against the counter. I'd go, you know what? It sure does look like a good day to go fish. And he'd go, really? You like to see what to go fishing? I'd, yeah, I see you got a tackle box out there. And I would con him into taking me fishing almost every week. And he would do it. That's gladly. awesome. And that was a fond memory for me. So, No, that's, that's awesome. It's funny. I, I, when I think back to it, and it was funny. You keyed it in talking about youth memories. And this was I'm older than three and five, but I remember – these beach camping trips to St. Louis Pass where they were centered around fishing, and they were awful. I mean, we didn't catch much, and, and they involved rashes and sunburns <laughs> and, and usually mechanical failures of some sort. Um, but I always wanted to go back, and it, it literally tattooed my heart with the ocean. And, and it's funny. I even remember one year. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty young at this point because I'm I, I, on my list for Santa, I put um, a camping trip to San Luis Pass. And you know my dad just cringed when he saw that one. He's like, oh, no, not another one of those. <laughs> right, right. But it, 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 it left that much of an impression that I, I dedicated my entire career to it. And um, it's there, there's a lot of power in the ocean and in the woods. I mean, there's, it's the same thing. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's that connection to the outdoors um, that, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, that thankfully we're seeing more and more people doing. And um, and that's not always been the case. So it's, it's, it's probably the a harbinger to great things in conservation as well yeah i agree and, and it's those childhood memories good and bad you know whether you you go to the beach and eat a bologna sandwich with that's full of sand or whatever it just it sticks <laughs> in your memory because you're out there in the outdoors and you're experiencing yeah. nature and whether you catch something yeah. or not or whether you shoot something or not it doesn't matter it's 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 just that that bond that draws you continually and you and you build on those memories it's uh, you the old adage don't let great be the enemy of good don't Try to find a perfect scenario where you go out with the perfect equipment and the perfect tools. Just get out there. Right. Uh, just just well, get out there point. and get yeah. your feet wet. That is, that's a good point. That's why sometimes uh, when you see these pictures of kids, and I'm not begrudging the kids or the parents or anything. Don't get me wrong. But when you see these kids and their first deer is a 200-inch deer, I'm like, ah, man, I wish they'd have gotten a doe or a spike or a really ugly deer yeah. or a hog or whatever, you know, for their yeah. first one. So, um it's that progression, that right, little yeah. progression that I think that is great to build upon. So, so Pat, sure. you speak all over the place. I know you speak, you know, numerous times throughout the year, throughout the month, that sort of thing. So, um, for those of you, and I can't imagine who it would be, tell people what CCA is. What is it about, and what is what is the mission of CCA? Sure, it's the Coastal Conservation Association. We were founded in Houston, Texas, in uh, 1977, and um, the origins are neat. It's a it's a fabled story. It's real, but it's got it's it's got a fable like quality to it it was 14 recreational anglers got together and and were really really despondent about the rampant commercial overfishing of of red drum and speckled trout and um and you know they got together and said we can make a difference and these visionaries said if we can put together some people and some money and some political influence we can stop this gill netting if people aren't familiar with um single-strand monofilament gill nets. It's a a very indiscriminate and very destructive piece of gear that suspends in the water column and catches everything that entangles its gills in it. So it can be, um, and yeah, and so they're just deadly effective, and um, and that's indeed what they were to those populations. And then around the time of the black and redfish craze, um, these populations of these great sport fish got 
really, really impacted. And so the the magic in this piece is these these guys got together and said, we're going to make a difference, and um, it worked. And they started adding more and more people, and they discovered this model for change of getting members and fundraising and advocacy. And that created a wheel, and that wheel started to roll. And before long, they had legislation in place that banned gillnets and then made um, redfish and speckled trout, sport fish in Texas. And then all of a sudden there were glances from Louisiana and Florida and other places that said, hey, we kind of like that model. Um, and now we do business on all three coasts. Um, and uh, and it's we've seen it, we've really seen the model work. And so Coastal Conservation Association is truly a grassroots organization. And um, we advocate um, for good fisheries management, but we also work aggressively in habitat restoration and creation. We do a lot of work in oyster reef creation, um, marsh restoration, and offshore reefing as well, which I think is probably the newest dimension of conservation um, in that it's become very widespread of trying to increase the biomass and and increase production um, of some of these key species like red snapper and, and other other sport fish that, that folks like to pursue. Right. And, and what exactly is offshore reefing? You know, it's uh, it's largely getting materials. It can either be man-made, well, it's all man-made, but it can be um, these large pyramid structures. Um, if you go on our website, you'll be able to see various um, iterations of that. You can also go, our, our National Habitat Program is called the Building Conservation Trust, and so you can go to buildingconservation.org um, and, and see images of these giant pyramids that have holes in them, and they're they serve as core habitat for things like uh, snapper, grouper, um, and then also sometimes it's sinking a vessel. Um, you know, we've had real good success, particularly in the South Atlantic, sinking these large decommissioned and cleaned um, tugboats, yeah. and which creates a lot of a lot of relief on the bottom, a lot of contour and structure. Um, you get these items on the ocean bottom, and benthic growth begins immediately. You get all of that sort of base stuff that you need that supports the forage base, all the food, <laughs> basically. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then, sure enough, they originally attract these species, um, again, be it a, an apex predator like a sailfish or be it a, you know, a grouper. Um, and then, you know, fish are funny because once you get them together, they do – primarily two things which is eat and spawn right and so they eat that forage that's convened there and then they start to spawn and create production and all of a sudden you get new year classes of fish wow so that, that's pretty cool exciting. that's pretty exciting all right folks we're going to take a quick break we'll be back with our guest pat murray of cca on the other side you're with hunting matters on kprc 950 another working week is over Good morning. Welcome back to Honey Matters on KPRC 950. I'm your host, Joe Bitar. I am Ramon Robles. And we're here today with Pat Murray. Pat is the uh, chief dishwasher yep. and cook over at CCA. You can learn about them at joincca.org. Pat, thanks for joining us this morning. Oh, it's a pleasure. I tell people all the time, I said, when they say, what's your title over there? I say, head janitor. Yeah. We are. Hmm. It's a it's a great team here of of, of volunteers and staff and um, and everybody's working hard for the cause. So yeah, I think you find that in a lot of conservation based organizations. I mean, I tell the people the same thing. They're like, "What do you do at Houston Safari? What does the executive director of Houston Safari Club Foundation do?" I'm like, "I clean toilets if I have to, man. It's it's all hands on deck whenever it comes down to it." You betcha. You betcha. So, Pat, in the last segment, we talked about the foundings of uh, CCA back in 1977. Started with a core group of 14 people. How many members are in CCA now? About one hundred thirty thousand. Only one hundred thirty thousand. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's uh, our main centers are um, are Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. Um, but we really, honestly, we have members all over the U.S. And one 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 kind of neat little caveat to that is um, a number of years ago we created our first inland chapter, which is our Nashville chapter, 
and uh, we found some some really hardcore conservationists there that were really into fishing and really into making a difference. And so we started a chapter there, and they do an annual event, raise money for um, for Habitat and for our National Habitat Program. And so uh, remarkably, we actually have a chapter in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. That's, nice. I had no idea. That's unbelievable. I mean, the population there is perfect for it. I mean, you, you know, country music uh, capital of the world, there's a lot of people who love to hunt and fish in Nashville, so I can see how that could work. You bet. You bet. Yeah, a lot of them fish. You know, they fish Florida. Um, they fish Georgia, South Carolina. You know, they're kind of positioned nicely to, to make trips in both directions. Right. Yeah, it's not like living in Texas where you have to drive halfway across the world to get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got I, I grew up in Louisiana, and you know, you could be from Monroe, Louisiana, to Baton Rouge in five hours, and and be on the on the coast in six and a half if you had to. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, we. The one thing we definitely have on the Texas coast is uh, a lot of resources. I will say they're stretched out over a long way, <laughs> but um, but the diversity of fishing opportunities. If you compare, you know, Sabine Lake with the Lower Laguna Madre, it's it's pretty exciting all the opportunities that's out there. Yeah, and, and being born and raised in Texas, I don't know any different. I mean, I, I just know, okay, you got to get in the truck and drive five hours. I mean, that, that's 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 the norm. It is, no doubt, no doubt. And particularly, I mean, I think particularly if you're an outdoors person because, mm-hmm. you know, you're not always going to be located where, where you want to be in terms of the species or the style of hunting or fishing that you really want to pursue. And right. so um, that that sort of nomadic quality of it, adds its own excitement it builds a road trip yep. into every trip which is kind of cool yeah i like i like those road trips going to get get prepared I, you know me i'm my wife makes fun of me because if i'm going on a big hunting trip i start packing the land <laughs> stuff out two weeks ahead of time just yeah. because that's just who i am but i think the adventure and the, the travel and the journey and whether you're fishing or hunting or whatever i think that's all part all of the that. part of the great part of the experience a- a- absolutely just like we were talking about the the things that really um you know really bond you with with hunt and fishing and 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 that's very much the same you know it's it's the road trip it's remembering as a kid stopping at dairy queen and eating really crappy hamburgers <laughs> all those sorts of things you know yeah. what yeah. is the best food item at dairy queen <laughs> you're asking me or pat i'm asking both of you I, unfortunately i can't answer that anymore oh, i'm glad I, well I, I, yeah if it was I, my I, wife i could tell you uh, exactly what the best food at a dairy queen is which, she would tell you it is a Dip top cone, mm-hmm. double dipped. Oh my goodness! Which you need a request when you go through the drive-through. That's legal. Oh yeah, I had no you idea. Tell them you want a dip top cone and you want it double dipped. That's the only way she takes it. And uh, I kind of like that Halitos burger with the yeah with the, with the fried peppers. jalapenos. Yeah. Like, oh mm-hmm. man. Sorry That's about so sorry about that, Pat. That's what you get for coming on the show. Ne- I should have never mentioned Dairy Queen. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Ramon's family owns a chain of Dairy Dairy Queen, so you've personally offended him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, we're the Queen family. That's our, that's our restaurant. Maybe I'll get a Dairy Queen care package in my mail. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll send you all the ice cream you can eat. Yeah. So, Pat, <laughs> hey, I won't be melted at all by the time I get there. Um, so, Pat, we talked about the Building Conservation Trust program that you guys have. I, I'm I'm intrigued, and I don't think that people know about all the other programs that you guys do. So you've got something called the Science of Conservation Scholarship Program. Now, that's a mouthful, but tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's been a neat one. We've done a lot of scholarship work um, through a number of universities throughout the U.S., and in particular in Texas. Um, but the Science of Conservation Program was – was one that we originally founded with the um, Heart Marine Research Institute at Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and Shimano. Um, And what it does is provide funding um, for graduate students in doing their work as they're pursuing their doctorate often. And um, we're really proud. Our first graduate um, is Dr. Kesley Gibson. And what's what's particularly neat about that is she's an amazingly dynamic young marine scientist, but um, people are more familiar with her than they probably know because if they watch Shark Week, they saw her um, hmm. on one of the lead editions when they were dealing with mako sharks. She nice. did a lot of work on tagging these just giant apex predators. And uh, so that program has been able to help scientists working on everything from harmful algal blooms, that's a mouthful too, (laughs) um, to to things like intertidal marsh study, um, habitat study, and of course really cool things like sharks. Yeah, my oldest son is now 30, gosh, I'm old, Mm -hmm. 34 this year. Okay. And he still texts me every week that Shark Week's on because as a kid, 
he loved Shark Week. I'm surprised he didn't grow up to be a marine, marine biologist, but he's still at this age. He texts me. That's cool. <laughs> it's Shark Week, Dad. That's neat. Yeah, that's neat. That's super cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a, so it's, it's been a great program, um, and, it, and it actually is even – we have a lot of neat crossover between our programs because there's another one called Release Sense, which is, um, you, you know, we – it's, it's it's again, in partnership with, with Texas A&M Corpus Christi and the Heart Marine Research Institute, but it's really become a mechanism to promote good catch and release practices. Now, as, a, as an organization, we're founded in – it's a – it's a good thing to keep some fish that are within limits and and take them home and eat them. Um, I know I love that. Um, But also on the ones you release, there's good ways and there's better ways and there's bad ways. Mm. And so we use that program to help educate. It also works um, in conjunction with the government in trying to make sure there's good practices like the sending devices in, in deep water fishing to make sure um, release snapper and grouper and what have you don't have bear trauma issues. Um, and so all of that weaves together because that's that magic nexus where you get science and conservation and habitat all come together and make really, really good futures for, for our oceans and our bays. Yeah, I think people sometimes forget that, uh, you know, the, the it, catch and release is an awesome thing, but, uh, you know, the way you release the methodology behind it and the sorts of things, you have to really be careful what you do and how you do it to maintain uh, those, uh, the viability of those released, uh, released fish. You bet. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's very, very important. Um, so, Pat, something that raises its ugly head every year is the controversy on uh, – red snapper limits and that sort of thing. Can you give us some insight on what that's like uh, for your organization on a yearly basis, the ups and downs of, of red snapper limits and, and you know, uh, commercial versus just the consumer fishing issues that you guys deal with every year? Sure. It's been a big issue for us for a long time. Um, it's funny. In our magazine, I looked at one point, I wrote my first article about red snapper management in 1992. And um, and it was going on before that, um, and it continues today, and it evolves today. We have a a advocacy team that works both at council meetings and around those, as well as um, lobbyists in Washington D.C. that work explicitly on that issue. And um, and we have ups and we have downs. One of the the ups was a stock assessment called the Great Red Snapper Count um, that Dr. Greg Stuns did, um, again from A&M Corpus Christi, um, that revealed a massive um, stock, much larger, or population, I'll use that word, uh, population um, in the Gulf of Mexico than the federal administrators had, had believed. And But then you walk right back into some of the federal statutes um, that, that can limit time on the water, even in healthy stocks. So we deal with it all the time. And there's times we're winning and there's times we're losing, but I can promise you that is a core focus species for the organization. And, uh, and one that, you know, I promise you it'll be, it'll be big in the next couple of years. They're doing, I won't get into the weeds of it, but some recalibration of some of the information that's recently come to light in terms of the population. And um, so we're going to be right back in the teeth of a, uh, of a management issue here pretty soon. Yeah, I've got a buddy. I, I hear from him occasionally. He's a, a guy I've known since I was a kid. He's a charter boat captain out of the Destin, Florida area, and it's it's always a topic of conversation with him. It is, and it's funny. This is a funny fish because it's um, it's it's become sort of the poster child of federal mismanagement, and what you find is you'll get people that are just wildly incensed about the management of that fishery, and uh, and there's lots of reason to be um, at various times, and then you ask them how much they fish for them, and they go, oh, no, I don't, I don't fish for them. Um, <laughs> it, it's just become emblematic of, of what can go wrong when a management system becomes that entangled, and that's, uh, that's really been the tale uh, through this fishery. Yep. Uh, absolutely. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Join us on the other side with our guest, Pat Murray. Pat is the National President of the Coastal Conservation Association. You can learn about them at jointcca.org. We'll be back with you in just a moment. You know, well, I'm a chicken fry. A cold beer on a Friday night, a pair of jeans that fit just right, and a radio. Good morning. Welcome back to Hunting Matters on KPRC 950. I'm your host, Joe Bitar. I am Ramon Robles. 
We're joined today by Pat Murray. Pat is the national president of the Coastal Conservation Association, or as most people affectionately know them, CCA. Learn about them at joincca.org. Good morning, Pat. Hey, good morning. Glad to be here. You know, it's uh, it's funny. I have seen the stickers all my life, and I never realized that this is who we're talking to. Yeah, it's I a went to the very, website. very, yeah, very it's identifiable very, brand. It's all over the place. Yeah, like I saw, and I thought, oh. That's what that is. I, I know your sticker. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of yours, Pat. That's great. <laughs> yeah, we just start the show all yeah. over now that Ramon knows who Here you really are. Here we are, 50 past the hour, and uh, I'm just realizing that I'm a big fan of yours. Well, That's great. And you do the the whole – do we still do the star uh, tournament? Is that what we it, do. I, you okay. know, it's funny. In, and in Texas this last year, it was the biggest tournament ever, um, which speaks to some of the things we've, wow. we've talked about previously with so many more people fishing. Um, folks said, man, I'm going to take the opportunity to, to join the, the TCA Texas Star Tournament and maybe win a chance to win a boat, motor, sure. trailer, truck package, or maybe win a scholarship for my kids. Yep. And it's, a, it's an exciting, fun tournament. Yeah, that's a really cool program. I mean, I, I see the the notices or the announcements all the time. It's it's a very. Cool I'm going to join, and I'm going to tell my wife, "You want to send your kids to college? You need me out on the water." That's right. You betcha. <laughs> I like that. That is fan. That is a deal there. Yep. So, Pat, uh, you recently had a book published uh, called uh, "It's More Than Fishing: The Art of Texas Trout and Redfish Angling." Tell us about that. Tell us about your new book and where people can find it. Oh, it's a fun book to write. Um, uh, Texas A and M Press, uh, University Press published it um you can you can buy it at amazon.com probably the easiest there's retailers like fishing tackle unlimited and others that have it um and like i say amazon's just always quick it was a fun book to write um because the goal was to make a how-to coastal trout and redfish book but make it really accessible and make it where it's not a tedious read it's got some photography in it that i think people will enjoy and um, and is really an an approach that cuts through any kind of silliness. It gets right down to what makes good fishing, um, and also touches on some of the things that that we've even hinted at that there's there's more to fishing than the, than the fishing itself, and and that there's an art there. And one of the key themes I wanted people to get from the book was you develop the art of fishing just like you would develop the art of you know cooking or the art of any woodwork or whatever it could be um you know fishing is a lot more than just going to the edge of the water and and trying to catch a fish and it can become a lifestyle and the more you allow it to do that what you find is the better you get at it and so it ties some of that to some real actionable things about lure selection and all sorts of things that hopefully will make people um want to go fishing and then then hopefully make them better fishermen yeah, there's a, for me especially, well, I mean, personally, there's a lot of intimidation involved because you see these anglers out there with the vest yeah. and the equipment and the boats, and you think, man, if I wanted to, I could, this could get complicated. I could go down a rabbit hole real quick. But a buddy of mine pulled me aside and said, look, just get you a cane pole, get you get you some bologna, and just, just get out there. And uh, that's what yep. I did. And, and it, I mean, just from the squirrels in the trees to, you know, the turtles on, on, on the on the shore. I mean, the kids just just love it. And it's not about bringing in that fish. It's just about being out there. You bet. No, that's exactly it. And, and, and the thing is, the more you fish, be it with a cane pole and, and baloney or offshore trolling, you know, for marlin, whatever yeah. you do, the more you do it the more you will become entrenched in it and the better you'll get at it. And probably yeah. it'll lead you to these conservation outcomes that we talk about because recreational anglers, just like, just like hunters, are the ones that lead to positive yeah. change in the resource. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, Pat, I know you've had thousands and thousands of fishing adventures and trips. So if you had to narrow it down to one that was – really at front of mind, whether it's special, most successful, most unique, what, what, would there be one that you kind of pinpoint off the top of your, off the top of your brain that really sticks wow. in your mind? That's a really hard question. Um, I know. You, you know we, we, we're, we're, you know, we're very, uh, uh, we're very serious we around here. We ask, we ask the tough questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great question too, because it made me sit and reflect and, 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 um, there's a litany of great, I, you know, sort of, I, a different, pieces of puzzles I can look at and think of, wow, this part was great, and that image was great, and I can remember that trip. But you know what's funny? Probably what leaps out at me is rather than fishing trips is the people. 
um, the people I've met through my fishing experiences and through years of being on the coast and, and not just when I was fish guiding um, and not just in the conservation arena, but even just walking, you know, on on a pier somewhere fishing, I have met some of the most fascinating um, people, and I think of um, some of the some of the guys that I ran around with the late David Wright, and and some current active guides that are absolute characters. People like James Plog and others that that I've learned so much from, and 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 maybe that's some of the beauty of fishing, be it learning from your dad or learning from a mentor. Um, you know, there's a neat sort of oral tradition that gets passed down through arts like fishing. And um, and so maybe maybe more than any one fishing trip, it would probably be more a cast of characters that, that would stand out in my mind. Yeah, I mean, it, it may be a stretch. I may be reaching here. But I, I've met some of the most unique people ever on the water, near the water fishing. They come from all walks of life. Everybody Absolutely. can fish. I mean, yeah. the, old, the, the old adage, more uh, more hunters fish than fishermen hunt. There's more fishermen yeah. out there, I mean, plain and simple. Huh. And uh, I, I think that's uh, some of the reason behind those successes of the shows, like the deadliest catch. And mm-hmm. I met some of those guys in person. We were up in Alaska hunting a year or so ago, and I met some of those guys in a cafe having breakfast before they went out. Wow. You know, and it's. I think that, the, the, I don't know what it is about the sea, about Freshwater, salt water, but the yeah. the characters associated with fishing are just that. They're true characters. They really are. And then what's neat is the fishing experience creates the bond. And maybe it's the bond that's the memory more than the than the yeah. person in terms of the standout. And and again, it can be between a a father or daughter and a mother and son or whatever, or a a, a, a guide and a client or a couple of buddies going fishing or sitting in a deer stand. That bond, that connectivity, there's people that I've fished with that I have a deeper bond with than people that I'm related to um, because it is that much of an experience. So I, I didn't answer your question, but um, but it, but I would say it's probably the, been the people. And, um, and, and unfortunately, I, I couldn't – well, maybe it is fortunately I couldn't narrow it to one. Yeah. It would probably be yeah. dozens. So uh, when you're not fishing, what do you do to relax? Work. You know, I work. Yeah, I, I, I work. A, I do work a lot. I'm definitely a self. Uh, I, I embrace my workaholism um, because I love what I do. Um, really, really love it, and I love the people that I get the fortune to work with, both volunteers and staff. Um, but also, too, I mean, even in in all parts of outdoors, I um, I mean, I love running. I love hiking. I like being out there. Yeah. And um, and there's just nothing like it, you know. Again, a lot of my day is spent uh, behind a desk, or used to be in an airplane. And mm. um, and but but yet the times I treasure the most, the times I feel the most connected, the most present, would be on the water or in a mountain or wherever. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, Pat, what's your what's your favorite way to prepare fish? Oh man, another hard question. Um, I tell you what, I've been doing a lot. I go in waves, um, and I have been fortunate to um, to have been catching some redfish down in Port Aransas with Dr. Stuns, um, who's an amazing fisherman as well as a marine scientist. And so I've been doing redfish fillets and doing a little egg wash, panko breading, um, whatever seasoning you like. I kind of put a little Italian twist on it and kind of ease toward thyme and oregano. Um, and then put a little heat in there and nice. serve that over some brown rice pasta um, with crushed tomatoes and garlic. Oh, man. It is Come on. so tasty. So we'll tasty. We'll here. be over at your house oh, in about yeah. an hour. We're go, on ahead, our way. go ahead and heat it up. Oh, it's really good. It's oh, good. Man. Well, folks, we've been joined today by Pat Murray. Pat's a national president of the Coastal Conservation Association, or as you know them, CCA. Learn about them at joincca.org. Pat, it's been a pleasure. Uh, We've learned a lot, and thank you so much for being a guest on Hunting Matters this week. That was my pleasure. Wonderful to talk to you both. All right, man. We'll catch up soon. All right, folks, that's it. We're done for this week on Hunting Matters on KPRC 950.